Mooring to a berth can be a very common and potentially risky activity. The function of the lines is to maintain the vessel alongside in all weathers. To achieve this, the lines have to remain intact so that the vessel and crew do not become victims. An effective line management plan is essential to ensure that lines are able to handle the forces applied to them both during and after the mooring operation. It ensures that the lines are in their designated place, in the best possible condition and fit for purpose. This reduces the chances of injury caused by a poor quality mooring line parting under load and snapping back into a person. The main benefit of mooring line management is enhanced safety for the crew and vessel. But there are a number of reasons why it is important to manage the lines on board your vessel. Primarily, the plan enhances safety on the mooring deck and helps safeguard a moored vessel. It helps ensure your operations comply with requirements and guidelines put in place by various organisations. As part of the plan, there should be a register for inspection to record activities associated with mooring line management. An effective line management plan can be the difference between a rope holding or snapping back. By monitoring the condition and serviceability of mooring lines throughout their life, you increase the safety of operations on board your vessel. The management of mooring lines is defined as the process that deals with and controls the lines on board a vessel. Managing mooring lines is an ongoing process that has to be undertaken and encouraged routinely. Each vessel should have a mooring system management plan as part of the shipboard management system. This includes the line management plan. Often, the two are called the mooring system and line management plan. Part of SOLAS applies to mooring fittings and mentions the mooring plan while the International Association of Classification Societies, or IACS, has guidance on all aspects of mooring and anchoring equipment. OCIMF provides lots of useful information on how to manage mooring lines in their publication, the Mooring Equipment Guidelines. OCIMF's Mooring Equipment Guidelines 4th edition, or MEG4, is aimed specifically at oil tankers and gas carriers but the information is relevant to any vessel type. While the advice it contains on the design and size of fittings does not apply to existing ships, certain parts are applicable, such as the need to have a line management plan. The mooring system management plan must consider all information relevant to the mooring of the vessel as a complete system. It will include details of all mooring fittings, loose equipment, and the risk assessments associated with mooring. A company should develop their own plan that can be rolled out across their fleet. The plan should be up to date with any amendments to the system and available for anyone to see. And a spare duplicate copy should be kept ashore with the managing company. The line management plan is there to manage the operation and retirement of mooring lines and tails. It should contain details of the requirements, assumptions, and evaluation methods used to determine the line retirement criteria. Typically, the line management plan will have records of mooring hours, line inspection records and plans, manufacturer and operator retirement criteria, test and inspection reports, and manufacturer's recommendations following tests or inspections. MEG4 simplifies the information needed to understand line tension requirements by defining many key terms that help in the management of mooring lines. The ship design minimum brake load is the minimum braking load of a new, dry mooring line or tail for which a ship's mooring system is designed. The SDMBL is the potential force on a moored vessel divided by the number of mooring lines anticipated for the vessel. It is the core parameter against which all the other components of a ship's mooring system are designed. Line design brake force is the minimum force at which a new, dry, spliced mooring line will break when tested. It applies to all materials except nylon, which is tested when wet. 
working load limit is the maximum load that a mooring line should be subjected to in operational service. For a steel wire rope, this is 55% of the SDMBL. All other synthetic cordage has a 50% value. Line stiffness is a measure of how much a line resists stretching and deformation. There is a wide variation in the stretch of lines. Longer lines will also stretch more than a shorter line of the same material. A vessel can be fitted with low stiffness lines when a small movement of the vessel is beneficial. However, high stiffness lines might be used to firmly hold it in position. Another thing to consider is the mooring line certificate. It contains information on the material and construction method of the line. Let's consider the other terms that might be seen on a mooring line certificate and what they mean. The certificate contains information about the line or tail. This may include the diameter and circumference, and the line design brake force, or tail design brake force when referring to mooring tails. It may also include information on the line linear density and the load bearing linear density. Line linear density is the mass of a sample divided by its length, including any protective outer sheath. Load bearing linear density is the mass of a load bearing material divided by its length. This value is less than the linear density because often the sheath is not load bearing. The mooring line certificate may also include line tenacity. Line tenacity is the load design brake force of the line divided by measured load bearing linear density. It is often called the strength to weight ratio. Angled brake force is the tensile force that can be sustained by a new line when bent 180 degrees around a pin with D over D ratios of 5 and 10. Angled endurance is how much this brake force is reduced after being repeatedly tensioned in the same manner. Axial compression resistance is the line's ability to withstand being compressed along its length due to cyclical loading. A mooring line and tail spends part of its life in use to moor a vessel and part of it in storage. They should be cared for at all times, though the care requirements vary depending on a number of factors. Keep stored lines out of direct sunlight to protect them from possible damage caused by ultraviolet radiation. They also need to be protected from heat, mechanical damage and chemical attack. If lines are on drums, place a cover around them. If loose, place them in a dry, ventilated storeroom clear from any danger associated with equipment or chemicals. Wash off any accumulated mud, sand or grit before storing lines to prevent particles inside the rope causing damage when it's under tension. Try to use fresh water, as the salt crystals can cut fibres if the rope is subsequently used when dry. Caring for mooring lines is essential if they are to perform when needed. There are a number of recommendations that apply to all types of line material. First, let's consider the bad practices that you should avoid whilst working with mooring lines. Never exceed the working load limit. Keep operational loads well below this. Never surge a line on a drum end. Never mix a wire with a synthetic line in a chalk or fair lead. Do not bend a line around mooring fittings with too small a diameter, particularly with wire that can easily end up permanently bent. Avoid dragging synthetic fibres over rough surfaces or sharp edges. Whenever possible, avoid passing a mooring rope to a tug. Here are some good practices that will ensure that lines are maintained in good condition. There may be others included in the line management plan on board. Place chafe sleeves or mat protection on parts in contact with chocks and rollers. End for end the line according to the time interval in the mooring line plan. Rotate mooring tails and ensure they are permanently and legibly marked for tracking and recording purposes. Crop the outboard end of a line if it shows wear or damage. Try to maintain a D over D of 15 or greater 
when a line passes around a roller or through a chock. Regularly grease wires using a mechanical greasing device to ensure there is penetration to the wire core. Limits the number of ropes going through the same fair lead to stop one rope chafing on the other. Ensure Panama leads and pedestals are smooth and free of grooves, and that's the attached roller's turn. The mooring line plan should also contain recommendations on how to protect lines in use during mooring operations. High modular synthetic fibre, or HMSF lines, such as Dyneema, present their own issues, and so you must take special care whilst handling them. Use a purpose-designed insert made of stainless steel or a polymer when using a chock or fair lead that was designed for steel wires. Alternatively, you can use carefully positioned chafing sleeves. Inserts help to minimise chafe, though polymer inserts of the wrong type can actually heat the line material. The last thing to consider is connecting a mooring tail. If the main line is a wire, always connect a synthetic tail with a proper metal link, such as Tonsberg or Mandel. Follow the manufacturer's guidance to ensure that it is fitted the right way round. A cow hitch is to be used when connecting a synthetic tail with a synthetic line, but never use this on a wire connected to a synthetic line. Let's have a look at the 10 most common causes of damage during a rope's usage. Excessive tension and shock loading. Cyclic tension wear caused by the line load rising and falling. External abrasion over objects causing fibre damage. Internal abrasion caused by the strands rubbing together. Cutting of fibres and strands over sharp edges. Pulled yarns and strands deforming the rope. Stress caused by bending around an object. Sunlight and chemical attack. Heat damage and fusion of strands caused by friction or an external source. Dirt, grit and salt cutting fibres. How many did you get? Lines can be damaged in numerous ways, and in cases where a mooring line on tail suffers too much damage, you must retire the line and permanently remove it from service. Retirement policies vary depending on ship type, where it is trading, and the conditions in which it is moored. Your line management plan should contain information on line retirement. OCINF recommend that a line is retired when its residual strength drops to 75% of the ship design MBL. This can only be ascertained by a shore test facility. Testing can be very helpful when predicting the actual life of a mooring line, where the manufacturer indicates an expected minimum service life usually given in mooring hours. Non-destructive testing of the line towards the end of this predicted service life indicates the strength it has and whether it can remain in service. There are different criteria on retiring a mooring line and tail, depending on the material used. You can find guidance on retiring wire mooring lines in ISO 4309 and MEG4. A wire line should be discarded if it has been stretched and the diameter is reduced by 10% or more, or if there are four wire breaks in a 6D length, or over eight breaks in a 30D length. It should also be discarded if there is a strand fracture or if abrasion of outer wires is over 7%. You can find the criteria for retiring synthetic mooring lines or tails in the Cordage Institute International Guideline CL 2001-04, as mentioned in MEG4. Retire lines and tails if moderate wear is seen and no records are available if there is a history of shock loading or excessive tension above the working load limit, or if there is visible damage showing broken strands. Similarly, there may be measurable creep caused by stretching. Other reasons for retirement include strands and fibres being internally fused by heat damage, the material of the rope is starting to powder, or there is melt friction damage penetrating more than 5% of the rope diameter or 15% of the rope circumference in width. 
bulges visible on a braided or sheathed rope can indicate twisting or knotting of the inner core. Damage to the sheath can also cause the core to bulge out. You should retire a line that has a knot in it that has been heaved tight. Or if there are more than 20% twistage strands that cannot be massaged back into an 8-strand rope. Lastly, retire a line with over 10% loss of fibre cross-section in an 8-strand rope or individual strand. Your company may have its own retirement policy in the line management plan. This should be followed as this guidance was developed based on the nature of the vessel trading along with advice from the line manufacturer. During heavy weather or other extreme conditions, mooring a ship can put immense strain on the lines that keep the ship on a berth. If these lines are not cared for, they can snap, endangering the crew and the ship. Let's take a look back at some of the key points that we've covered. As part of the vessel's safety management system, each vessel should have a mooring system and line management plan that complies with relevant guidance and regulations. The line management plan contains a number of records that help to ensure safe and effective mooring operations. The plan will put procedures and best practices in place that reduce the amount of damage caused to mooring lines. Lines are damaged in a number of ways and are only meant to be in service for a certain amount of time. When a line meets the retirement criteria, it must be permanently removed from service 